my dad's milk. But so he would he would uh, deliver the schools in the bars, and then he would come back, and he would take a little bit of a rest. But then at two o'clock in the afternoon, he'd be back out collecting the money for the milk. So he would be back out there doing it, come back for dinner, and then go back to bed around eight o'clock at night to get up and do it all over again the next morning. One day, my cousin and I went with him. Uh, it was very rare we did it because at two o'clock in the morning, you didn't want to get up as a little kid. But we went out with him one morning, and my father must have had this plan because he was always a real corker. But we went to deliver at one of the houses, and it's pitch black, and we're putting the milk into the milk case. And just as we did it, somebody grabbed our hands from the other side. <laughs> and of course, we screamed at the top of our lungs, and it exactly. was quite an experience. Of course, my father was in the truck laughing like crazy. But it was a, I'm sure he planned it, but it was, it was quite an event. It really was. And there were times I would go out even collecting with him, uh, in the afternoons, and your biggest thrill was to sit on a milk crate uh, in the wheel well of a truck. And you had like nothing to hold on to. And I can remember him saying when he would turn around the corner, he'd always say, spread your toes. And that was always a real fun thing. We still laugh about it today, spread your toes. Because you had nothing, you're sitting on a little milk crate, you had nothing to hold on to. There weren't seat belts back then. I spent a lot of time with my grandmother. I could speak Lithuanian as she spoke Lithuanian not necessarily read it, but I, I could speak it. The only thing that I remember that she talked about often was that she came by herself, and that's why I, 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 it just kills me to hear this, uh, from the old country in the steerage of a boat at the age of 16. And I, I think about this often, you know, she's by herself, knew no one, and she's all of the age of 16. She, of course, ended up in New York City, and I don't know who it was, but somehow she got to Rochester again for Hickey Freeman. And she worked there quite a while before, I believe, before she met my grandfather. And then once, once they went to the dairy, she quit working at Hickey Freeman. I don't have any dates in my head or anything. Um, How many children did they three boys and a girl. Our mother was the oldest, and then, her th then she had three brothers. None of any of them are alive. My Uncle Eddie was the last one to die, right? But no, Uncle, Uncle Vicky was the last one to die. But I'm Uncle sorry. Frankie did work at the dairy yes. for many years. What about your Uncle Edward? He, was a he worked, he, no, they were all veterans. Were all, veterans. all three of the boys were veterans. When I was gonna go away to college, my parents couldn't take me because of the dairy, and that would have been in 71. So the dairy was still going on in 71. But a few years after that, after it closed, my father had a different job, and I remember sometimes taking him to work on the oh, way to work. It. So I'm going to guess it was probably maybe around, um, somewhere around maybe 73, 74. Albertman remembers life in the 40s when there were still horse-drawn wagons in the streets. We lived pretty smart in those days, and uh, you did what you had to do, and that's it. And uh, it, I'm digressing, but th my father had a beautiful rose garden, and uh, it was my job to get the manure that the horses dropped in a neighborhood and uh, scoop it up with a shovel and there was a guy down the street that he used to have to race to get it ahead of him, you know, and uh, so then I would bring the uh, manure home and he spread it around his rose bushes. And, uh, so people were, who was riding around on the horses? Well, the horses uh, were used to draw the ice wagons and the garbage wagons and uh, in the winter the snow plows. When, when I went there, uh, it was the St. Oh God, what is St. Francis nuns from Pennsylvania uh, taught there, and they they were um, Lithuanian women, so they spoke the language. Uh, and it was I see how kindergarten first and second in one room. Help me, Bev. I think it was the same when you went. We didn't have kindergarten. Oh. We only had two first, classes in one room, first and second, second, you know, third and fourth. Fifth and sixth, seventh and eighth, they had to be four rooms. Right. That's yeah, I mean. yeah, yeah. Father Frank used to give out our report cards 
And that was like, you know, he was basically a good guy, but you, you sweated every time the report card was coming out. It would have been a lot better if we could have just got it from the nun and then just take it home and take the punishment at home, but we had to take it twice. Annie Baluk was my godmother, and um, so I really remember him well because I felt like the family connection, especially when the report cards were given out. Sometimes if we were really lucky on that day though, sometimes he would give us the next day off, which was pretty cool back then. We were kind of hoping for a day when he'd do report cards. Um, I remember when St. George's used to have court on Fridays, and the eighth graders were the report people. And they used to stand in the hallways and you couldn't run and there's certain things you couldn't do. And I just remember one year skipping up the steps from the basement to the first floor. And I remember Johnny Shirkus reporting me. And when Friday came for court and you were probably, you know, in fourth grade and you had to walk up in front of all the eighth graders, I just remember being terrified. And you had some sort of sentence, which I don't remember what it was back then. But yes, I did get reported in court. He was young, good looking, and uh, energetic. And uh, he let me drive his car. And he had a 48 Dodge parked in a garage and had a fluid drive and what I did as an altar boy I would get out and drive in a circle around the back of the church never went out on the street okay and I would back it around a circle then put it forward and go over front ways around a circle and and, that's, and and then put it back in the garage so so now my godfather Sylvester Butcher took me for uh, driving tests and uh, I, I took the test in his 1934 Ford and uh, but when I, I got my driver's license I said to Father Frank how about if I borrow your car we want to go to a football game down at Cornell in Ithaca which is about 100 miles away he says okay he says put in spark plugs put in spark plugs in a car then you can drive it then so I tuned up the car and uh, he allowed me to take it down. So then he says, now don't drive over the speed limit. And uh, I said, oh, of course not, you know. So now we came home and, and it had rained. And he says, you were speeding. And I said, how do you know that? He says, because the dirty rain on the car is all sideways. It's not hanging down, you know. He says, so you must have really been moving. <laughs> Which is probably the truth, I don't remember that. <laughs> but then another time we had uh, a baptism at uh, noon and uh, in those days they were a separate thing they weren't part of the mass okay and there was a Buffalo Bills game in Buffalo at one o'clock and we had the baptism and I said father we're never going to make it to the game in time he was taking us oh we'll be there and we got there, we got into the stadium, I'll never forget it, we walked into the stadium and they were kicking off the football and it went right through the uprights. The guy kicked it through the uprights. In those days, the goalpost was on the zero line. It wasn't 10 years behind, you know, so. But that was Father Frank, you know, that's the way we lived. And then the other thing that uh, we had happen, I, I mentioned uh, in, in my uh, letter there that uh, we got $20 given to us by uh, the uh, military, uh, the Navy officer who got married, and his best man gave us $20 tip to the older boy. And Father Frank says, that's too much money for you guys. And he took it away. And uh, so he says, we're gonna have a picnic later on in the year and we'll, set, uh, we'll spend the, the money on that picnic. And well, the picnic consisted of a hike around Arundakoi Bay. We walked from St. George's, down Clifford Avenue, out south of Rundaquay Bay, up the Bay Road, and then a, north to the lake, and then across the uh, outlet, and back up Culver Road, and we all collapsed, uh, and we couldn't walk another step at the uh, cemetery on Culver Road. So Father Frank uh, and John DeBicus, they walked the rest of the way home and uh, got his car and came back and picked us up. So that was his idea of a picnic for the altar boys. And uh, 
Oh, Father Bakshis was the pastor, and I was a altar boy for both Father Bakshis and Father Valuk, Valukavichus. Father Valuk was, uh, we called him Father Frank, and uh, he was uh, a good teacher. We had to answer the prayers in Latin. So we had the Latin Mass and during that time. That was before the altar was turned around as it is now. And we answered all the prayers in Latin. And had we not really answered properly with the, Lithuania, with the uh, Latin Mass, he had a triangular ruler that gave us a little attention on it, some areas of the body. Was this Father, Father Father Frank would do that. And sometimes he'd make us kneel on chalk. And just just in, instantaneous, he says, now you kneel there. Now we would kneel there and get up. Now that's the extent of that. But uh, he would show us that he was very intent on us learning the uh, language of Latin. The Zagos would come out every week, and after Mass, Father would come out to greet the, the parishioners who were at the Mass as they were leaving. And right at the, his elbow, we were selling the Zagos. The altar boys were selling that. And whatever we made, believe it or not, uh, all the money went to us personally. So it was a real fine thing and really made us happy to uh, serve the Mass with Father Frank. That was one of the ways he could reward us uh, for, for being his uh, attendance during Mass. There was Sister Mary Chrysostom. I still remember her name. She was the big burly one and her face was always red. And this is what I remember, that big nose of her. She had that big red bulbous nose. And I got in trouble once. I was uh, fooling around in church. Me and Dangole Povelaitis, we would always uh, have we had two little car coats, and then it was new. A car coat was something new. People were just getting cars. And we had our pumpkin seeds. We loved pumpkin seeds. So one pocket would be the shells, the other pocket would be the pumpkins. So when the nun wasn't looking, you were eating your pumpkin seeds. So we were, we were very, very good about that. We were, we, you know, we were experts. But one day, I don't know, I was just feeling very mischievous. I came up with the idea of putting my shells in the collection box. And guess who told on me? Virginia uh, Virkus. And I've never forgotten that. She told on me, so there I'm sitting in the classroom thinking I'm so smart, I got away with this awful thing. And Sister Chrysostom goes, Ruta, out in the hall. Vito Valuk, out in the hall. And all these other, all the baddies. And I was one of the goodies. I never did anything wrong. And I go out there and I go, oh my God, God help me. I've got to think quick, you know. She's got us all lined up and then she had this broken yardstick that she used to hit the kids with. And it was broken, it had a sharp point because it was, and, and then she's pointing and shaking it at my nose. She says, you, Ruta, of all people, what, what have you got to say for yourself? And I'm going, oh my God, I got to think fast. So I said, you know, sister, you told us to give the thing that we love so much to to God the most our most favorite thing and I love my pumpkin seeds she says get back in the room and I and then that was the last of my big big escapades that's that's as bad as I got what absolutely upsets me to no end is the, are the stories about the nuns with the rulers and the beating people you know and all that and I honestly have to say in my total career at St. George's I don't remember that ever being an issue. I remember them, you know, I was no angel either. And I don't remember what I did. I did something. And I just remember the nun, and I can't even remember what her name was when it must have been sixth, seventh grade. <laughs> she 
took me down. Are you, are you familiar with the hall? You're familiar. Okay, so if you go downstairs and the bathrooms are down there, she was standing down at the bottom of the stairs one time, and she just called me down. So I went down. I didn't think too much of it. And she says, whatever it was, she goes, I just want you to know how disappointed I am in you. I can't believe that you did whatever you did. I never, I never gave her one ounce of trouble after that. And it's not that I'm a goody two-shoes. It's just that she, that's how she presented it. She didn't yell, she didn't do anything. She ruled by love and caring and that kind of a thing. And I honestly can say, even though we had a couple terror boys, I never saw any one of them get a ruler or anything else like that. I remember Father Rashidus. Oh yeah. And I remember a really unfortunate day, because we used to go to church all the time, sometimes before school, but I remember him fainting on the altar. I remember him passing away shortly after that. And Father Yanushka, I loved Father Yanushka. He yes, was great. He was such a reachable priest. A priest. I mean, somebody you could just become a friend with, and he was just, just a funny guy, and he was just really great. And I remember Father Valuk, I remember he used to travel a lot. I remember him going a lot to Italy. I remember my godmother having a lot of cut Italian class in her house. Because sometimes she would escort, she would go with him. Because she never married. My godmother never married. And um, so I do remember that about him. And I remember Sister Lucy, the principal. I remember a few nuns here and there. Do you remember Father Mutzkavichus, Dominic, and Charles? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Yes, both. I remember when they used to come to our house at Christmas and play their accordions. Oh, that was fun. Yeah, and um, you know, my father had played the saxophone, and my other uncle, Isma, used to play piano, and we used to have great family get-togethers at Christmas. While St. George's Parish remained the hub of Rochester Lithuanian activity, another organization also emerged as a player in Rochester Lithuanian social and political life. The Gediminas Club on Joseph Avenue attracted those who were Catholic and non-Catholic, those with a political agenda, and those who just wanted to have fun and socialize. Sonia Wendt is a descendant of one of the Gediminas' club most well-known early members. Jonas Bullis was an advocate for workers' rights and an artist whose published political cartoons reflected his political beliefs. My grandfather was born Jonas Bullis and came to New York uh, in 1912. He was born in 1883 in Krampui, which is in the Yonishkis province of Lithuania. He was one of four children, the youngest, and he was the only one of the four to go to grammar school. But even that he did not finish because he was rented out to a neighboring farmer to work as a shepherd. And later on, uh, as he was growing further, a priest in the family suggested that he study for the priesthood. But my grandfather's ideals and attitudes didn't move along with that. And so this very same priest supported him in going to a school in Kaunas, the city of Kaunas, to study tailoring. And that was what he did. Well, after studying tailoring, my grandfather went back to his hometown and sewed clothes and so on for his friends and neighbors. But primarily, he went to country houses around the area where he would stay with a family, do tailoring for everyone in the family, and then move on to another place. So he had an opportunity to see people who were better off than his lot, and he developed some ideals about doing things for the people of his uh, type of occupation. He was drafted into the Russian army in 1905 and was in it for several years. I noticed on his uh, papers that were filled out when he joined that they said he was illiterate but they meant illiterate in the Russian language. Uh, he traveled to Georgia area while he was in the army. And he was also involved in distributing uh, leaflets 
to people within the army. Uh, he didn't get into any trouble there, but uh, after he was released from the army, he went back to Yonishkis this time and married my grandmother in 1910. He left Lithuania, I think, for a number of reasons. One of them was that he had known my grandmother's siblings who had been advocates of the peasant class, the poor workers. Some of them had been jailed around 1905. And when they got out of jail, they chose to go to the United States. So my grandfather already knew a number of people over here. And he felt that the way things were going by the time he got out of the army, that they weren't necessarily going to improve. Uh, situations were getting worse in Europe in general. And I think that he felt he would stand a better chance of representing his people if he came to the United States. It would help him and he could help others as well. As far as I know, my grandfather had one and only place that he worked, and that was Hickey Freeman Clothiers. And they were in the area of the city that was bound by Clinton Avenue, Joseph Avenue, Norton Street, and Clifford Avenue. There were about 500 Lithuanians living in that general region, plus many other immigrants who also worked in the clothing factories. There were Italians, Polish people, and so forth. My grandfather was, as I said, not formally educated, but he was self-taught in many ways. I think he was a, an upright sort of man who had high standards. I believe he was articulate and could speak for many of the people who couldn't speak for themselves. And he was able to do that in the particular clothing factory he was in, but also for others as well, because he could witness for himself the low wages, the long hours, the child labor laws that weren't always being followed, much of what had been going on in Lithuania. And he wanted to make life easier for his fellow Lithuanians and other people. Well, it was, that was about the time that the Amalgamated Clothing Workers of America uh, was getting going, and they did succeed in unionizing. And my grandfather worked for the same factory for 30 years, so they must not have uh, held anything serious against him because life was better for the employees as a result of his efforts and the efforts of the people around him. I was able to go to the Get a Menace Club when I was a child. It was an interesting place. They had a bar, they had a very busy kitchen, they had a stage. I had learned from my mother that when she was a young girl, she was often in the plays that my grandfather wrote and directed, and as were other children of her age. Uh, they had dances where my grandfather's band, he played the clarinet, would entertain. There was dancing. My grandmother was a good cook, and she and some of her friends worked in the kitchen producing wonderful Lithuanian recipes that I recall very well. And it was just a happy place for people of the same cultural group to get together. They were there, they were very much involved in the operations of the club. I understand that at some point in the 20s, and that I can assess from the book of his cartoons, he was being published for his political cartoons and he was using the pseudonym of Lumbus. Uh, when about 1930, or a little after that, he started being interested in portraiture and doing other kinds of oil paintings. So he attended a couple of classes 
at the old Mechanics Institute before it became RIT and studied painting. And at that point, he started painting oil portraits of some of his heroes of his early youth. Uh, I can remember pictures of Vladimir Lenin, of Karl Marx, and so forth. Later on, when it was rather inappropriate to have such paintings hanging on the wall, uh, they were painted over and eventually destroyed. But he, at that point, decided he would turn to painting the scenery. He would go outdoors with his canvas and paints and easel and paint out in the countryside. And he also gave a lot of those paintings to his friends. And later on, after he wasn't able to move around as freely, he started painting floral portraits. And that was where he connected with my grandmother because she was a super gardener. And she would grow the roses and the other flowers, then he would pick them and do paintings. So there was another connection. I'm sure he had many questions and he was looking forward to doing much more of his artwork, his writing. He had written some poetry under the name, I think it was Radutus. He wanted to do other things, but he died before he could accomplish them. I really don't know how he was feeling about those changes. He did make a remark that he wished he had never painted some of the people he painted while they were still alive, because he learned later that some of them had certain ideals which changed as they were convenient to them. And he thought it would be better to make an assessment after their death, after more information was known. But as a young man, I'm sure, as many young men are, he was influenced by the people who were speaking the loudest, and so forth. It's interesting that when you're growing up, at first you're finding your own way, then you're raising children, often. Uh, at some point, you have time and energy to look into more information about your family. And I had spent the years from about 1998, almost to the present, looking up various sides of my family and my husband's family. And I'm still working at the Lithuanian end of it. Even as a child in school, I felt quite proud of having a more complicated heritage, that I had a mother born elsewhere, I had a father born elsewhere, uh, I had a name that wasn't as common as some, uh, it was just very interesting to me, and it, I think it kept me going when there were times when I didn't feel popular with the children around me. And I also developed an interest in ballet when I was quite young, an interest that was shared by my mother and grandmother, who began taking me to performances at the Eastman Theater when I was seven or eight years old. And then I chose dance as a potential career. I wouldn't say I was a ballerina, I was a soloist, a principal dancer. Uh, I studied ballet in Rochester as a child. I went to New York City after high school. Uh, I studied at the School of American Ballet, where, which had been founded by George Balanchine and where my teachers were Russians who had come over to the United States with Mr. Balanchine. People like Pierre Vladimirov, Anatole Obukov, Felia Dubrovska. I, I was able to pretty well pronounce their names as well. But these were the teachers who were working in New York City at that time. I knew Jonas Jankus as John Jankus. Uh, if he is the gentleman who is about my age. We were in school in Rochester at the same time. We were studying at the Eastman School of Music in the ballet department with Thelma Berkeley and Olive McHugh. And he appeared in some performances 
of the Mercury Ballet, which was the company that was started in our city in 1951. And we both graduated from high school at the same time and found ourselves in New York at the same time, auditioning for the School of American Ballet. And I, he was my pal for about a year and then circumstances separated everyone and I never saw him after that, but I often wondered what had become of him. My grandfather had little jokes he would tell about his fellow tailors at Hickey Freeman in Rochester. He would say someone would come up to him and say, I cut the pants twice and they're still too short and things like that, which is not really funny, but it was amusing to me. Uh, my grandmother was a fairly serious woman, so she didn't tell funny stories. And the only time I remember her really laughing was one April Fool's Day. I would never have expected her to tell me some sort of joke and then say April Fool, but she did. And it really struck me as being very different. Both my grandparents have very serious faces on most of their photographs. And I think that's true of many pictures that were taken in those days. But I also think it was that sort of demeanor unless they were having an especially good time with their friends. I don't remember grocery shops other than a couple of Italian stores that were close to where we lived. My grandmother would go to a shop on Joseph Avenue that sold geese. They would be hanging from the rafters and she would say, don't just cut off the feet, give them to me, I want them to make kosher lana, which was a dish she liked to prepare. And she would also go to the local bakery. She also was accustomed to walking from Burbank Street to the public market, which is on Union Street, and then come back with big bags full of potatoes and other foods. So those people who lived in that area, you know, had left very rough conditions but they didn't live in a very sophisticated way even after moving to Rochester. Well, see, we didn't have a dance hall or anything at St. George's Hall. That was a place that people like to go, they can drink beer and they had dances every week over there. At the Miller's Club. At the Get the Miller's Club, yeah. <clears throat> and I used to go over there because I like to dance and stuff and you know, all the dances and the Lithuanians were all there. and. <clears throat> A lot of Lithuanians that went there were from St. George's, and there were a bunch of Lithuanians that didn't go to church at all at St. George's. They just were active Lithuanians and stuff. So we got a mixture of Lithuanians, and we knew them all. Well, back in those days, they kind of resented the idea of uh, people going there because this is a Catholic church here, and this is a, they call it a Protestant stuff. I belong to get them in, I belong to St. George's. What's the difference? We're a bunch of Lithuanians, it's just a hall. They had a dance hall, we can dance and stuff, and entertainment, they're all the same Lithuanians. So we mixed. No, I don't know any Lithuanians that were there, but I do remember that we participated, we would go down to their club and shoot a shoot pool in, in their, in their um, bar area. And uh, he would allow us to do that. And he said, you guys should really learn how to shoot pool. So we did, and we, that was on Joseph Avenue. I went to the, that uh, Get Him In Us Clubus twice. Once with Sabatis, I don't know if you knew him. Which one? What? Antana. Antana Sabatis. Uh -huh. I went there, just, just he wanted me to show me what kind of people meet there. And we went there towards her. Uh, you know, like during the day when there was the, the bar was open and, and, and there were some guys going up to the bar and then they, I walked over there and I said to, to them, what are you reading? And the, the man looked at me and says, well, I don't really understand. Um, and I looked at the newspaper, it was a communist newspaper and he couldn't read it anyway. 
because he was still he was Lithuanian, but he was an older person, so he, whatever. 